Well, good morning, church family, and uh, welcome to the service this morning, and welcome to anyone who might be listening in this morning. We do want to welcome you. I know that uh, with the lockdown having moved to, to level two, I know that many have been able to visit friends and family. Um, we've certainly been out to, to visit family, and it's just been great. Uh, my wife and I, we've been speaking about it, and we were just saying that how God made us for community. Uh, God has made us relational beings. God has made us to, um, for one another. And really, that reflects the heart of God. Um, God, our triune God, has been a God of community, uh, a relational God, uh, even in eternity past. And so when we long to be together, when we long to be with other people, we are reflecting our Creator God. And uh, it is a joy uh, even just to be here this morning as we get to worship our God. I want to welcome you to our service. Uh, we only have one announcement this morning. We uh, just want to make you aware of uh, the meeting, the King's Rubies meeting, that will take place the 29th. Uh, it's going to be a Zoom meeting, and it's going to be at 3. So just keep an eye out for that Zoom link that will be sent out on uh, the social media platforms. Thank you. Our scripture reading today is from Galatians 4, verse 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is our reading for today. Father, we come to you and we acknowledge that you are God and we are not. You do not dwell in temples made by human hands. God, you are not served with human hands as though you need anything. You alone are the ultimate authority and from you and through you and to you are all things. To you alone belong the glory. God, there is no one like you. There's no one worthy of our praise and our adoration. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you, God, are the King to be feared. You are to be feared by those who do not know you, those who stand in opposition against you. And you are the King to be honored and loved and served by your people. And to us, God, you are a good King. And we stand in awe of your love and your grace and your kindness and your mercy to us. And, and we fear you and we honor you as king. God, you only seek our greatest joy and our greatest good. And that is giving yourself to us. You are our greatest joy. You are our greatest good. You alone, God, satisfy. Lord, every time we sin, every time... Uh, we have sinned in this week as the people of God. It's because we've believed the false promise that there can be something more satisfying outside of you. God, we, we know it's not true. You alone satisfy. And God, we, we come this morning, we praise you. Praise you as the sovereign God. You are sovereign over all things. God, your sovereignty it gives us hope. It gives us hope in the midst of this dark world that we're living in. God, it's your sovereignty that makes us hold on to the promise that you will work all things for our good, even as you worked your son's death for our good and for your glory. God, no disease catches you by surprise, and your arm is not too short should you choose to deliver. You, God, will accomplish your purpose. God, thank you that you love us as Father. Thank you that you've adopted us. And thank you that you are busy transforming us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And we know that one day we will fully be like your son. And we know that since we have this hope, 
We purify ourselves. We, we put off sin and we pursue holy living because of what you've done for us. Lord, continue to remind us from your word and through your spirit that we are your children, that our identity is not rooted in what we do, what we have, or what other people say about us, but that our identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess this morning that so often we have to ask, help us in our unbelief. There are times where we doubt your promises, even though you only have a track record of faithfulness. There are times where we question your goodness and we stand with raised fists in protest in our pain and in our discomfort. God, we are often no different than the, grum the grumbling Israelites. We so easily forget that we got grace when we deserved condemnation. We got grace when we deserved condemnation for our rebellion and sin against you. Like Israel, we forget your goodness. We forget the slavery that you saved us from. And we often do not see your goodness. God, our short bit of suffering here on this earth cannot be compared to the weight of wrath that was poured out on your son Jesus in our place. Lord, we confess how we all in some way in this week have bowed our hearts to false gods. Forgive us as we are quick to make idols of lesser things. Oh God, we, um, we want to ask that you would forgive us for that. We want to get to know you more through your word. God, give us a greater view of yourself so that, so that self would fade away more and more as, as we see it in comparison to your glory. Lord, we want to pray for our church. We want to pray for those in need in our church. Lord, because we are your children, we can come with boldness. We can come with confidence to your throne of grace. And we come because of the finished work of, of Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. And God, we pray. We want to ask that you, uh, through the power of your spirit, would grant those who are suffering in our church to know the deep, deep love that you have for them in the time of need. A love that is so strong that not even death is able to separate and break them from that love. Lord, there are many needs in our church. Lord, some are in need of you to spiritually revive them, and we pray for that. God, we pray that you would show them that Jesus is more beautiful than evil, more beautiful than the sin that they want to hold on to. We pray for spiritual revival in our church. God, some in our church are in need of a physical touch of healing. And Lord, we humbly ask, we, we don't demand, we ask that you would heal, knowing that you are able and nothing is impossible for you. And Lord, we pray for that. We long for that. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to see the needs of the people around us so that we can love them better. God, maybe it's a student that needs a call. Maybe it's a, it's a family that needs a meal. Maybe someone needs a job. Uh, parents in, in need of encouragement during the, the tough times. Lord, there are so many needs, but most of all, God, let us, let us see our spiritual need. We have come like those who are poor and needy and are daily in need of your power and sustaining grace. God, you are merciful to all who trust in you. But Lord, we pray for our church that you would raise up many laborers for the harvest. The, harbor, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And God, we want to pray for those laborers to be raised up. But God, we also want to thank you. Thank you for those laborers that you have raised up. Every single missionary in our church is evidence of, a, of an answered prayer. And God, the harvest is plentiful, and, and all kinds of people come from that harvest. Thank you, God, that you are saving people from all backgrounds. Thank you, God, for that work. Thank you for saving and sending us out on that mission. God, we pray for many faithful gospel preachers to go out. God, and, and thank you for, for many faithful gospel preachers and, and churches in Pretoria. Many that we know of, many who proclaim Jesus Christ as the only hope of the nations. We thank you for them, God. God, we pray for our nation. Let us live respectfully towards those in authority. Let us do good to all, as your word says, and especially to those of the household, those in the church. 
Let us not repay evil with evil. But God, may it be clear to this world, may it be clear to our country, to everyone, that if we are called to, we are willing to suffer for doing good. We are willing to suffer for Christ. We will stand for truth. We will please God, not man. We will fear God alone. We will respect and honor our leaders and, and all those in authority, those over us. But there is no king but Jesus Christ. Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of this world. You came firstly meek as the meek Lamb. You were led to the slaughter. But Jesus, we long for and we wait for the day where you will return as the Lion of Judah, the victorious King. You will come back in power and glory and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we say, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. We long for that. And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray this. It's for your glory that we seek these things. It's in the name of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray these things. Amen. I want to thank uh, one of our elders, Quinton, for, for that prayer. And... It is my turn to proclaim God's word this morning with you as we take a, a break from Hebrews again. Um, and I want you to open your Bibles in Romans chapter 10, verse 5 to 18. I, and I really do encourage you to have your Bibles with you as we go through the passage. And so let us... Read what the Word of God says. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him um, of whom they have, not, that they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Lord, I do ask you that you will speak to your people this morning. Speak to us, we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is a wonderful passage, a uh, very evangelistic um, passage, and we're going to dig a little bit into it. Um, Melissa and I have had the, the, just the privilege of seeing now Levi start to eating solid. Some of you have seen um, a video or two on, on Facebook. Of, of him eating, and in that little transition, he starts, the, the first spoon is never nice. He like 
shakes his head and is, uh, wants to kind of spit it out. Um, but then eventually he, you know, he t- has the taste of it and, and things Im- improve like that. Um, and, but but the, the first, as we introduce the solids, it's, it's hard to, to swallow. And, and I just wanted to uh, kind of use that as an illustration that part of the sermon today is going to be a little bit hard to swallow. Now, before you send me all the emails <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> um, I, I would like you to, to just chew on it and meditate on, on what God is saying and in God's Word. But I'm more than happy to um, uh, just respond to any queries uh, but let's let's dig into the scriptures, and in a second you will see why what I mean by by this. So we need to look at the context. This part of Romans 10 is part of a bigger argument that is from the end of chapter eight all the way to to eleven. Now, in chapter eight, there are a number of promises that God is promises uh, God is promising to the people. Of God, and Paul anticipates the Jewish believers in the congregation day in Rome saying, Well, what about us? What about the promises to Israel? Has God failed to, to fulfill those promises? And Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 9, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descendant from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be be named. So Paul starts to say not all Israel is Israel. Not all the descendants of Israel. Abraham belong the promises. And what he's is going to, and he's definitely talking about salvation. He's talking in verse 8 about who are the children of God. And he will talk about the remnant, even within the chosen people of Israel. God had always had a remnant of people that he chose. And he will go on to develop in Romans 9, the doctrine of unconditional election. Romans 9 is maybe one of the uh, most um, unpopular chapters in, in the Bible. But God has always had a remnant who he chose. The, the, the fact that people uh, came from the line of Abraham did not mean that they were the children of the promise of the covenant. So he, he says in verse 3, in verse 13, sorry, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Even before they were born, God had already his purposes on, of election to take place. Paul again, he anticipates the pushback and says in verse 14, well, what shall, then, what, what shall we say then? Is there injustice in God's part? And Paul says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Quinton even prayed uh, just now, saying, we, we, we deserve condemnation and it is by God's grace. And, and God is saying here, it, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Verse 16 so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Again, Paul anticipates objection. They, they might say, but, but Paul, this is unfair. Because how does God still find fault in us? If he has elected some... And ours, how, how is it, how does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? And what does Paul answer? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? 
Paul goes on to say, you are just the potter. You, sorry, you are just the clay. He is the potter. He can do with us whatever his purpose is. He goes on to say, um, these people of God who he called the remnant are not just from the Jewish heritage, but both from Jews and Gentiles in verse 24. And he's going to re reiterate that in chapter 11, um, showing how God has not rejected Israel. Paul, it's in, in actual fact, says, look at me. I'm one of the Israelites. God has not rejected Israel, but he has grafted in the Gentiles um, to, be, to receive the promises of the covenant made with Abraham. And this is the large argument that we see from verse from chapter 9 to chapter 11. And you might think, well, okay, Isaac, we read this amazing passage in, in chapter 10. Why are you bringing in chapter 9? Uh, I want to point out a few things that kind of sets how chapter 9 sets the tone for evangelism. In chapter 10. Now look at, look at uh, our passage. Both, both chapter 9 and 10. Um, it starts with Paul having a real heart for the lost. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. That's in, in chapter 10. Can you see that though Paul believes in, in, in God electing and choosing unconditionally, he, this does not lead him to, to be um, indifferent to evangelism. On the contrary, Paul is saying, I cry out. He, in, in, in chapter 9, verse 1, he's saying, I wish I could be a curse. He's, he's willing to, if there was a way to go to hell in order that his fellow Jews would come to faith in Christ. What has sometimes happened is that some that believe this amazing doctrine of unconditional election... They have fallen in the grave mistake of thinking they can discern who the elect are and have become to cold towards the lost. And, and, and this, is, this is not an option. This is, this is not the attitude of Paul. When is the last time that you have cried for the lost? We have received this amazing salvation. And because Paul understands this is, this is grace, this is God's favor. And I, I, I want my fellow Jews to, to be saved. You and I ought to have a heart for the lost. We ought to cry for those that are perishing. And you ought not to give up on anyone because you don't know who God has chosen or not. And it is not up to you. God is the decider. God is the Savior. See, Paul, chapter 9, crushes human pride. It says it, it's not based on, on human doing. It is God who does. And so Paul heart for the lost is, is very evident. Paul understands that salvation 
is not a human transaction, but God's supernatural action. Let me say that again. Salvation is not a human transaction, but God's supernatural action. The other point um, that I want to mention here is that with that understanding that God is the one who saves, this should guide our practice. I believe that our theology should dictate our methodology. What do I mean by that? Let me illustrate. We live in an age where evangelism has become um, a tactic regarding human transaction. In other words, you will hear something like this. If you say these words and you mean it, you'll be saved. I've heard it on, on youth rallies and things like that. If, if you just say it like this and you really mean it, you'll be saved. And Paul is saying, it, it is not of human, it's not a human transaction. It's not, if I do this, I'm, 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 I'm saved. I can, in myself and, and by human tactics... Be saved. Salvation comes from God. Only He can give it. So in evangelism, we, we don't declare people to be saved. You don't know that. You, you can't see in His heart whether it's true faith or not. You, you, you don't just go and, and say, well, you, you're saved. And then 20 years later, We, we don't know whether, whether they have truly trusted Christ or not. And so we, we don't go and, and, and declare salvation where for what, what often happens is maybe a, a youth leader or, or someone will say, well, you, 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 you did this prayer, you said the words like this. And so you save. 20 years later, the, the guy is living in the world and, and he's thinking, well, I don't have to worry about it. My youth leader told me I was saved because I did a prayer 20 years ago. If I understand that salvation belongs to God and not to men, I will faithfully deliver the message and I'm going to pray for the person. But... But God does the saving. I can't do the saving. They cannot save themselves. Salvation belongs to our God. I know that this is a difficult doctrine to swallow. But let me, let me make an observation. I, I, I believe that one of the reasons this doctrine of election is so hard to swallow is because it takes men out of control. It says to men, you, you, you cannot, you cannot save yourselves. It is out of your hands. It is God who saves. It is by his mercy. And the moment you demand mercy, it is no longer mercy. This, this doctrine has often been um, accused of killing evangelism and missionary work. And yet this doesn't seem to be the case with Paul or in church history. Uh, I mean, maybe just share a couple of names of, 
of men who were greatly used, who believed the doctrine of election, and yet went throughout the world to preach the gospel. William Carey, the father, the father of modern missions. John Elliott, David Brainerd, Jonathan Edwards, David Livingston, here maybe the most famous missionary in Africa, Adonir and Judson, George Whitfield, and etc. Two things, just to remind again, the tone, that is that our hearts cry out for the lost. We understand that God is the one who saves. And now in, in chapter 10, Paul is now going to show how does this salvation come about? What is the means? How, how does this come about? So we go back to our text in, in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So he, he's making a contrast here. The, the Jewish... Um, the, the people of Israel believed that it was by the law that they became righteous. And so if, if they believed that they became righteous by the law, they ought to be living by the law. But Paul says the contrast is that you are justified by faith. And he quotes from the Deuteronomy 30, 12 to 13, and he reinterprets it. Now with being fulfilled by Christ. So one of the commentators puts it like this. There is no need to travel to heaven to bring Christ to earth. For God has already sent him into the world. Nor should anyone think they must bring Christ up from the realm of the dead. For God has raised Christ from the dead. What God requires is not superhuman works. But faith in the gospel Paul preaches. That, that's what it says in verse 8. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. That trusting in the gospel message is, is the means by which you are justified. It's, it's by faith that you are justified. And so he goes on to... Um, uh, speak and, and say these amazing um, verses from verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's saying the method, the means by which both Jews and Gentiles and Greeks are saved is by faith. And so we can confidently echo what Paul is saying and look to anyone in the eye and say, if you trust in Jesus Christ, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. It is a universal message of salvation. Tell everyone. Now, if you are like me, I'm, I'm not always very rational, but if, if you are very ra uh, leaning towards being rational and thinking about things, you, you may think, Isaac, there seems to be a conflict between chapter 9 and, and chapter 10. There is like a, a paradox there. And 
And there is, it's not in conflict, it's a paradox. And I, I want to show you another passage that illustrates this, maybe let's say, tension. Um, John 6, 35 and 40. And, and what I'm going to do is, as I read, I'm going to point out chapter 9 and chapter 10. Um, uh, and you will see it on, on your screen. That it's both, it's, there is uh, election and yet there is, the, you, you, need, you ought to trust Christ. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever, chapter 10, comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever, chapter 10, believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Chapter 9. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Chapter 9. And whoever comes to me, chapter 10, I will never cast out. Chapter 9. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing, chapter 9, of all that he has given me, chapter 9, but raised him up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, chapter 10, who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. We preach all of the Bible. The tough, the tough passages and let's say the easy ones. We, we, ought to, we ought to take everything in. And so Paul then from verse 14 starts this logical argument. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He goes on to say, well, but how will they call? How will they call on him they have not believed? In other words, if someone doesn't believe that Christ can save them, they will not call on him. But how will they believe if they have not heard of him? Now, sometimes we hear this, well, just just believe. Just believe. Have you told the person? Paul would say to you, have you told the person about Jesus? How are they supposed to believe if they have not heard? How will they hear without someone preaching? Now, here's an important thing to remember. There has to be proclamation. In our evangelization, there has to be proclamation. I've, I've heard this sometimes. Oh, I try to witness with my life. Now, that's, that's great, but that's not good enough. There has to be proclamation of gospel, of the gospel message. It is through the preaching that they will hear. It's by proclaiming that they will hear. And how will they preach if they had not been sent? Now we don't use this word sent much. We um, maybe except when we're talking about missionaries. But I want to say something to you. If you have received the gospel message, you have been sent by God to proclaim that message wherever you are. Anywhere and everywhere, you ought to be proclaiming. Don't, don't think of, oh, sent out there, I am sent, you are sent God has placed you in a specific place around specific people to proclaim the good news to everyone. How beautiful are the feet of those who, who bring the good news. Now think about this. How thankful you are for the person that shared the gospel with you. That you, you're saved. Some of you, it was... Um, your parents grew up in church. Some of you, it was, you were completely lost 
and in going a completely hellbound race. And someone came along and, and shared this amazing good news. And you're now being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And you belong to him now. And you think, oh, how beautiful are the feet of those who brought the good news to me. I'm so thankful for that. And then in verse 17, there is the crux of the matter, right? If, if it is by faith that we are justified and, and, and we are saved, how, how does this come about? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, Pastor Charles mentioned last week, faith is given to us by God as a grace gift. We see this in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, both grace and faith, is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of words so that no one can boast. And so, even in this verse 17, faith comes from hearing, which, which points to us that faith is not inside of us. It's not something that we, it's just a power that hasn't been activated, or you, you, must, you just need to muster it up and, and just activate this faith that is inside of you. Faith comes from outside. But listen to this. The means by which the gift is received is through the regeneration of the Spirit through the gospel proclamation. So the way that this faith comes about when we share the gospel to other people, it is through the preaching of God's word. It's the proclamation of this message, and that message is specific of Christ, who he is and what he has done. One commentator puts it like this, faith comes by the utterance of truth from and about him, I mean Christ. It is through the gospel which is the power of God for salvation that one comes to believe. So there has to be gospel proclamation. We have to believe in this message of the gospel. I, I had the privilege of last week um, preaching to a conference in, in Peru to young people. It was uh, via Zoom. Uh, it was early. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Um, and, and it was for, for a whole week. But as I was sharing with them, I was saying, we often, in, in youth ministry, we, we want to get young people, we want them to come to church and, and be saved, but we don't trust the gospel. We say, well, we have to do really cool games. We have to, we have to, um, have these amazing things happening, these amazing programs. And what happens is once you stop doing that and you want to move to the right stuff, they're going to leave because they came for the games. But you need to, from the beginning, preach the gospel. That is the strategy. That is the way that God saves people. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't try to reinvent the simple gospel of Jesus Christ coming to earth, living a perfect life, dying for sinners, being raised on the third day. Repent and believe in Jesus and you will be saved. That message of the gospel is what God uses to save people. No need to use other strategies. And I want to just end with application. And one of the, I want to end with maybe a 
maybe a, a specific application first and maybe a more general one. And this first one is, I guess it's because of the season I, I am in, in my life of just having become a parent. I, I want to talk to you parents this morning. Preach the gospel to your children all the time. I, I don't have much experience in being a parent. I've only been a parent for six months. Uh, but I, I was a, a youth pastor for about eight years. And I encounter young people after young people whose parents have been in the church their whole lives. And yet their children did not understand the gospel. Let me say to you, it is your duty as a parent to teach the gospel to your children. It is not the church's primary duty. It is, it is not in Sunday school, even though Sunday school, we have great Sunday school uh, uh, teachers who are going to teach the word of God to your children once this pandemic is over. <laughs> But it is not their duty. It is your duty as a parent to over and over and over again beat the gospel into their heads. Parents are often so worried with, does my child read properly? Does, does my child... Um, uh, is is not doing well in in maths and and needs to understand to to learn an instrument and all of these things which are good things are great. But I, I want to urge you: what good is it? What good is it if if they're not saved? What good? What? How does math matters? If at the end of the day, your child ends up in hell. Pray, preach the gospel to your child. I was, um, the beginning of the year we went to a conference and a fellow pastor of, um, we were chatting and, and I, I was really struck by something he said. And I was like, I need to start doing that. Melissa had him given birth, and he's like, I started preaching the gospel to my child when he was still in my wife's tummy. And I'm like, yeah, I need to do that. I need to do that. I mean, Levi is so cute, right? He's, he's so cute. He's the cutest baby in the world. Uh, I'm a biased father, but he's so cute, and, and I love him. But I told Melissa, he's a little sinner, He's a sinner. He, he was born already in sin and he needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm trying to over and over again preach the gospel to him. Even though he just smiles at me and preach the gospel to your children. Parents, please, please do not forsake your child's spiritual walk. He, he can do all these other things. He can learn all these other things. But please instruct your children into loving God. Spend time with them. Reading the Bible. Preaching the gospel. Over and over and over again. It, 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 don't leave this as a task for the youth worker. Or for the pastor. Or for the church. It is your duty. As a parent. Preach the gospel to them. This is, is, is the only way. They will be saved. Not, not just stories. Stories of the Bible are great. Not just stories. But teach them the message of Christ. Please. That they will, they will come to know Christ. Your first place of evangelism is at home, parents. If, if you look at the stats, most, 
most people, even, even to the people that, that I'm talking right now, most of you would probably say that you have been, you were saved at a young age. And so it is crucial that you start from early preaching the gospel. And the rest, and this, uh, the other application is for everyone else. There is a duty of us who have received this great news, who have received grace, to proclaim unashamedly the gospel of Jesus Christ at your place of, of work. And, and understand that this message, you are just a messenger. Okay? Sometimes you may be confronted. It may get uncomfortable. This past week, I was wearing a shirt uh, that my, my dad uses uh, as a kind of evangelistic tool in a way. But it says it, it was in Portuguese, Jesus, this name. And at the back, he put different phrases, heals or saves. Or, um, and this particular one uh, says uh, delivers or redeems. And, and a guy came to me and, and just like asked, what, what does it say? You know, and, and I explained to him. And uh, I, I don't know which church, but he was saying, no, Jesus is not God. And, and <laughs> this was like at the entrance of sport, spa, all of a sudden I found myself having, having a, <laughs> a theological almost debate. This guy saying, Jesus is not God. And I'm saying, Jesus is God. This is what the Bible is saying. And, and afterwards, um, I told Melissa, my heart was racing. I mean, it didn't get heated or anything, but afterwards my heart was racing. I, I told oh, Melissa, oh, my heart is, is racing. And, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm just the messenger. This is, it's not about me. This is not, it's, it's never personal. I have a message to deliver to everyone and I need to be faithful in doing that. If they reject it, if they attack you, it's, it's not about you. Because again, that understanding that only God can save. Only God saves. You, you just deliver the means by which they are saved. So I, I, I really hope and pray that we as a church will be a church that proclaims that message all the time, everywhere, unashamedly. Unashamedly. But this is the message that brought us salvation. Whether it gets uncomfortable or not, we'll proclaim this message, everyone. Pray that God will give us a heart for the lost. Not to be just comfortable in our chairs just comfortable where we are, but thriving forward with the gospel proclamation wherever we go. Let us pray. Oh, Lord. We, we thank you so much. Because you, by your mercy and your grace, you have saved us. Lord, I ask you that you would give us boldness not to be ashamed, but to boldness proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone, Lord. Lord, we ask you even for those that are in our families that we will Preach the gospel over and over again to them. This is the message that brings salvation. And that we will not give up on them. That we will constantly be on our knees and praying and asking just as Paul did. God, that you will save them. We ask you that you revive us and you put a fire that is contagious 
that we will proclaim Jesus. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name.